like and like just being called like an attention whore or something like that which like that's what it is like just call it, it is that's what music like being an artist is it is being an attention whore like i'm talking about Bring it Hi, Chabba. How are you? Good. How are you? I am doing well. Uh, we spoke a little over two years ago. I don't know if you remember. It was like in the beginning of COVID. <laughs> oh, like summer 2020. Yeah, it was like May, May 2020. Yeah. We, uh, You had released uh, Pink Pony Club was out and then you were about like a week before you released California. Yes, I remember this. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that was so much- crazy. Right. I mean, so much has changed since then, obviously. I know. Well, it's great to see you. I'm Adam, and uh, this is a podcast about you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So yeah. Sweet. Um. So I went back and and re-listened to to our interview before, just to kind of so I don't ask you ten million of the same questions. But I do have <laughs> a bunch of follow ups, and I wanna um and I wanna like kind of just have you recap your story a little bit. Um, but it was really funny because in the interview, you talk about how you, the first time you sang was at a talent show and you sang a Christmas song and you're like, there's a footage of it on YouTube and I found it. <laughs> yeah, it's on YouTube, very like openly. Anyone can go find yeah. that. <laughs> I think it's under your dad's channel. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great performance. I couldn't believe that was the first time you ever sang for people and you like invited your whole family, right? Yeah, my whole family came. No one knew that I could sing. I guess like, I mean, I was just really private about it. I was really nervous about people knowing that part of me, I guess. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it was just so interesting because I'm like, I got a lot. I got to find this, and I found it, and I was just shocked how good you were. I mean, <laughs> obviously you're good. If if your whole family was like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna really push you now. But, yeah, they uh, after that they were like, okay, you should probably go for this, and I was like, you know, whatever. But it it was interesting. I had like such a different style back then. I was like very jazzy. Wanted to be very jazz. Mm-hmm. Well, even like that for you did like a, a record because I found some other songs that you had put in, uh, under your original name mm-hmm. or your yeah, and like it's very ballady. Like a oh, very, it's so ballady. Long, I mean, it's easy ballad. to write ballads. It's easy to write ballads and sing and and like ballads are usually what what beginning what you start writing when you're you know start out writing. Ballads are the easiest to write and like emotional songs are come out a lot easier than like clubbing songs i guess i don't know no no for sure but to be able to sing a ballad that's a whole different skill oh. set yeah <laughs> sure. I, yeah I, I just was very into the drama of it all as an eighth grader i was like this has to be dramatic sure sure no i love it um oh well, okay so born and raised in missouri southwest mm-hmm. missouri is that what is that what i remember yeah okay yeah. well refresh me tell me about it uh, a little bit more small town yeah small excuse me, small town. I grew up in Willard, Missouri, which is outside of a smaller, a bigger town um, called Springfield, Missouri, which is a little bit more known, but um, it's a far, it's like in the farming area of Missouri. Um, So it's just very open, a lot of um, like cows, dairy farms. Um, Uh And my town had like 5,000 people in it. And um, I grew up there like my entire life. And it was, I never quite felt like it was where I was meant to be. Mm-hmm. Because it wasn't, I don't know. I just felt like I didn't get along with, with I didn't connect with a lot of people my age there. And I kind of, still feel that way today with as it relates to Missouri or is it just in general oh just like yeah just well in general like in it's just a completely different part of the country as where you know it's opposite of of where I am now and I adore Missouri of, of how like it brought me so many different perspectives than as if I were um raised on the coast I would be like obviously completely different but I feel like it is a part it is like past like Missouri is 
Yeah. It's in you the know, rear view. Like I don't I don't really see myself moving back there. Sure. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you kind of told me about that last time, like when we were talking about Pink Pony Club and just kind of the inspiration behind it was yeah. like just getting to L.A. and kind of having this like awakening, like, oh, like, what is it? Like, this is so much different than everything I was ever taught or know or. Yeah, exactly. Um, I come from I'm from San Diego, so mm -hmm. it's interesting because I since we talked, I, my family and I, we moved to Nashville. We live in the uh, south suburbs of Nashville. Okay, cool. And to me, which is, I love it. And it's does, it's probably not nearly as rural and in small towns is, you know, mm -hmm. where you grew up in Missouri, but like driving down the street and having people wave to you, it was it's like, was foreign to me or like <laughs> yeah. somebody letting you go at a stop sign. I'm like, what the hell is happening? Like, where am I? <laughs> just because yeah. I'm so used to LA, San Diego. And like, I lived in San Francisco for a while. So it's like just a different mindset, but I can see coming the other way, how you know, how massive of a, of a, you know, difference it is. Yeah. It definitely took some adjustment. <laughs> massive. For sure. um, yeah. But I'm grateful for like that whole portion of my life. Mm -hmm. Just, it, it gave me like such a different perspective on so many different things that I would have lost if I would have not grown up in the deep Midwest, you know? Mm -hmm. so. Do you still have, uh, uh, do you still stay in contact with all your friends and stuff there that you, you made? I have a friend group that I made like in high school, like five or six people. And I do stay in contact with them. Like they're flying to my show next week in New York City. Oh, I'm very cool. Gary Ballroom and they're all flying out from Missouri. But um, yeah, I just like go back to, I I'm like coming to terms with things. I'm not like quite as bitter as I was um growing up but like going back there like mm -hmm. now I I just like like going for the nature and like my friends and family but I don't really I'm not there like making new friends you know what I mean right no 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 I totally understand where you're coming from <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you mean you don't go back all the time to try to meet new people <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well okay so you you grew up there obviously and when do you get in involved in music at all like it sounds like obviously the first time you sang in front of a crowd of people and, and you invite your whole family and it becomes like oh wow we we need to really embrace this because it's something she's very talented at like before that were you you were in piano lessons or anything like that voice lessons yeah I did piano lessons when I was like 10 or 11 for like a few years and then I got into voice lessons shortly after that um talent show situation mm -hmm. that you're talking about. Um, I mean, it's not like I was writing songs like since I was five or right. like singing and performing and just like dreaming of this. Like it just, I always loved Britney Spears, but it wasn't like this consuming thing. Like music wasn't everything for me growing mm -hmm. up and I still don't think it is. Really? Mm -mm. As successful as you are at it. No, yeah. I don't know. I I've come it's really changed a lot this year as like just kind of realizing maybe I think the industry like entertainment industry in general just encourages to make like your craft your everything and I don't think that that's great for me. I don't think I would be I don't think I'm my best version when music is everything and my my entire passion and life like that seems so whack to me really like, yeah I, I think it's I know like most of my friends in the music industry like music is everything to them mm -hmm. and it is like they're what is driving them and like that is awesome to me I just don't feel like it's that for me mm -hmm. Which I appreciate I how honest never, you are. You've I always, never, even in huh? all your interviews, you're so honest. <laughs> like, instead of just being like, oh, yeah, I love it. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, you're just so honest. And I, I really appreciate that. Well, yeah, of course. I just like don't know if it's healthy for me to like be consumed in this art. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. how do you how do you balance it? Um, By getting out of the music industry, like making friends outside of the music industry like doing things like I've really picked up crafting and I know that sounds so 
actually no it's not even lame it's awesome um, no i was gonna say why it, is it lame that's rad it's not lame it's awesome um i like love crafting so much like a bunch of different crafts and like I love making my outfits for the videos and for tour and I love designing and I like love biking around and like I don't know music isn't consuming me anymore Mm -hmm. I think LA like Hollywood in quotes makes you think that like this is it this is all you will have. This is all you will ever be like. And it's just not true. Like this isn't, I don't even think this is like my final career, to be honest. <laughs> That's rad. Well, like, I'm, I'm good at it. I think like the reason I'm doing it is because I'm like really good at it. And like, I'm like, I'm good at like building a world and like, I'm good at singing and like writing music, but I'm like sick. But like, I would love to be like an art therapist. So I like want to, I'll do this for like 10 more years or something. And then I'll go back. To, I'll go to school. You know, be an art therapist. Yeah. I would love to be an art therapist, like work with like maybe like teens and just like, just, I don't know. I just like really enjoy. I feel like that is fulfilling to me. That would be like, like helping someone in that way mm-hmm. would be fulfilling to me. Okay. Um, just, uh, just because a lot has changed since the last time we spoke, cause you had been, you know, pink pony club was doing this big thing. And then you had California coming out, which we were talking about and how, you know, you were like, it's, a, I hadn't heard it. Cause I hadn't came out yet. It was like mm-hmm. week, weeks away. And then you listen to that song and, and it's interesting because now you're talking about like, you know, I wouldn't go back to, to Missouri and like befriend people, but it was like, you were kind of in the space of like, you were missing it. Right. I mean, the song it relates to, you know, you're not having the seasons here in LA and it's just still probably pretty depressing. Now you're in this big city mm-hmm. and you only knew what the, the, what the kids that went to summer camp with you that you were living yeah. with. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so interesting. I say like, I could never go back to Missouri, but then I have a song called California begging to get out of it. It's, it's such, that's that how was my, like, years ago. Right. I mean, that yeah. was still to think about that. It doesn't feel like it was that long ago at least for me, because I'm like, we're still sitting kind of inside and talking over soon. Right, yeah. But like, you know, in, in reality, that was, you know, over two years ago. Yeah, it's always just been like that. It's mm-hmm. always been like, I hate it or I love it here. Okay. Same with Missouri, I either hate it or I love it. And it's just like that with a lot of things. And I think that's why there's always, it's always a push and pull. It's never just like, ah, oh, finally here, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you never really arrive when it comes to the music industry, right? No. In the sense of like- Yeah, you will. You like think that like certain milestones, like for example, like the Olivia concert, like I opened for Olivia Rodrigo in mm-hmm. May. And that was like the biggest crowd I've ever, like that's a big deal for me in my career. Well, it's a big and, deal for anyone. Yeah. It I mean, was she like, was the biggest thing, yeah. at, you know, at the moment. She's big. She's huge. And I, like, thought I would arrive somewhere. I mm-hmm. thought I'd be like, oh, like, I'm here. Like, I've been working my whole life, like, to do this. And then I, like, got off. Like, I remember sitting in my hotel room after the concert and being like, so that was that, you know? Mm-hmm. like obviously it's fucking awesome and like so grateful that she asked me to do it like it was amazing it couldn't have gone better like but in my heart I thought I would it would make me feel like a level up like I, w- I would level up somehow and it's like no mm-hmm. you were I was where I was the night before you know what I mean right right I mean it comes down to like thinking and I'm curious how you feel about this because it's like you go out to a crowd of people, like you're opening up for Olivia Rodrigo or whatever, a big, you know, one of your shows and you're playing to thousands of people and you're on the road seeing all these people every night, but then you're going back to your hotel room, right? And you're still, yeah. then you're, it's almost like you go from all these people praising and like, oh, loving what you're doing. And then you're home and you're like, now, you know, I'm in my, you know, <laughs> hotel room by myself or I'm doing this. You're kind yeah. of just, it's like extreme to kind of an extreme. Yeah. Yeah. And I could see how that would be really hard to kind of balance. Yeah. 
that's hard to balance. I only did one show with her. She only asked me to open her last show of the U.S. tour. But you've but done other huge shows. Yeah, I've done like, yeah, I mean, that you... was definitely the biggest. But sure. I don't know. I think you're like, you just, I think this is in, in any industry, but especially the music industry. Like when you get something really big, you think that you will arrive somewhere and be like, oh, I'm here. Like finally. Mm -hmm. And you're not. Yeah. Hey, we were there the whole time you know? I think, is that something I, I feel like kind of with just creatives in general? Like, I don't know if like Taylor Swift has arrived, like at what point does she go, I've arrived, you know, like, yeah. or she wouldn't be doing it anymore. Or like, I mean, not that I can even compare myself to you or her or whatever, but like, if I got an interview with certain artists or like I did something in when I was doing radio for 17 years prior to this, like, it was like, I did it. And then it's yeah. like, now what? Right. Uh, it's always chasing the next thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it doesn't really change things that much. Really? Yeah. Like, uh, it's like, it's like, it's sick that I got to like open for Olivia for like one show. Like, that's awesome. But it's like, okay, well, who's next? Who's, you know, it's not like, it's like you get a, a massive artist to like. Yeah. You know, on your podcast right like okay you get taylor swift cool that's like her one time can right you get Harry styles next can you get lizzo next it's like you have to keep beating you gotta like, keep beating it right so it's, it's just like it doesn't it doesn't exist like <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> i don't know <laughs> no i see what you, it's so true um because it's always the next thing what's next okay i did that that was great and then what's next and as you kind of have to reflect uh, and I've noticed this when I've interviewed artists that kind of go back and, and, oh yeah, I forgot I did that. Like that was super cool. And then yeah. like, and it, you kind of have to go back and find these like grounding moments, I guess, of, of, of where you're at. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely been, I mean, from, from where we spoke last, you know, to two years now, um, are you're not with Atlantic in, anymore, are you? Yeah. Well, so like, a, so a lot has changed. And I mean, was that, before, actually, I want to rewind a bit. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay. So. Just to just to chronologically run through here, just so uh, it makes sense to somebody that didn't listen to maybe the first yeah. interview we did. <laughs> okay, so you uh, grew up in a small town. You had you even had like a playlist, right? A Pandora playlist that you didn't know. Like you grew up in a really conservative household. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I like snuck Pandora onto my iPod Touch and like listened to Drake, and um, like that's kind of how I. I don't know. It just like I, I like snuck my way into like this pop, like hip hop world, and and like got obsessed with that mm -hmm. music. And then, and was that pre or, that, or was, post? Like you, was that before or after you had done that talent show? After. Okay, and because you did like, like what American or uh, America's Got Talent auditions, like you did that whole road too. That whole like the voice. I still get asked surprisingly <laughs> have to get that I should audition for American Idol, like, I think, like. People will still tell you that? Like, you should audition. I'm like, no, I'm fucking not going to do that. Like You're like, here's my Spotify. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, uh, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> like, let me show you the last 10 people that made it through American Idol and their <laughs> Spotify numbers, okay? Why don't you it's, kiss my it's, ass? <laughs> so, it's so, Midwest loves talent shows on TV, I will say that. Um, <laughs> You were but in the Springfield talent show too, weren't you? I was in Springfield Scott's talent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one was fun. That was cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, I got, so yeah, I like got really into pop music and like my grandparents really wanted me to go into like country music mm -hmm. or like some people were pushing me to go into like the Christian scene. And I kind of like always wanted to be anti like everything like any anything that like people wanted me to do like I wanted to literally do the opposite sure um which still like happens today I still I definitely like swing so far away from what people um, want right yeah, I mean like, but it makes sense it's like well you should do this and it's like well now I don't want no to do it's, that. it's like <laughs> I will like literally do the opposite and a lot of it is to be honest, is like sometimes out of spite, just to be like, look what I can do, and you can't do anything about it. And 
mm-hmm. to just like somewhat like piss my hometown off just to like I don't know where that comes from inside me but it's it's like there's just this like deep drive to like somehow make my hometown hate me it's so weird were you but, like uh w- w- growing up there was it something that people got behind like you're you're because I remember you told me, which I thought was actually pretty cute, that uh, when you got signed to Atlantic Records, like the the they got on the PA and they're like, oh, just so you guys know, uh, <laughs> school and Carolyn I- Rose just signed a deal with Atlantic Records, yeah, or whatever they did. <laughs> they did that on the school announcements in the morning. Like, I think that's so I funny know. and so cool. They did that, and then well, people thought I was lying. People oh. did think I was lying, and I don't know. There's just like this some like eighth grade version of myself still in my 24 year old body of like being like the rebellious teenager Mm -hmm. that I never like really got to be and like I think like that is like my pop project now is like singing about like a lot of sexual themes a lot of gay stuff like Mm -hmm. drinking like I just wanted I want to like feel like this rebellious version of myself that I never got to be growing up. Which I think is a perfect, it, which now hearing the new song that's coming out mm. totally makes sense to me. Cause it's got that validity beginning and then it's just like drops and you're like, you're fucked something or yeah, I can't remember yeah. what you say. <laughs> and then it just yeah. picks up and yeah. I was like, this is dope. Like, and that just kind of, for me, it sounds like that's how you're, you know, Missouri to, to LA transformation kind of yes yeah feminine phenomenon which is the song you're talking about yeah is yeah the perfect like example of like the two worlds into one song mm-hmm. you know yeah the, so well just going back to to your hometown and was it something that like people just didn't you said that they didn't believe you first off and was it like were you getting a lot of negativity towards you or people being like, Oh, you're not going to make it. Is that kind of why you're like, I want to show you like, do, do you remember any of that? <laughs> um, no, there was probably I could count on like one hand of how many negative comments I've gotten over my singing in my high school. Like, it's like, okay. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I, like I'm a, I don't even care if this sounds cocky. Like, I'm a good singer like you can't really really tell me in high school that I'm like not a good singer so I I was just like so no one like really tried to like touch that area um and that would like the other what was um more so of the the like negativity I got was like oh she thinks she's la 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 like like just there was a lot of like strange jealousy shit going on which mm-hmm. is of like obviously we're 15 year old kids like well you know whatever so that's gonna happen mm-hmm. but it wasn't like you're never gonna make it like no one's ever told me I wasn't gonna you know, make it okay which I'm really lucky like and even if someone did tell me that I'd be like literally what do you you don't know anything like yes I will you know I don't know <laughs> I know that sounds so insane and like cocky it doesn't though I just know and that whole portion of like people trying to beat me down just never happened. And I got like super lucky to not experience that. Um, And if anyone ever did, it would just like fire me up even more. So, Mm -hmm. but the negativity just came from, she's not, she thinks she's all that. It was more of that. Sure. It was that it was just like cattiness. Mm -hmm. Um, like and like just being called like an attention whore or something like that which like that's what it is like just call it, it is that's what music like being an artist is it is being an attention whore like i'm <laughs> talking about <laughs> like what's not like be on the bus like <laughs> it is. so they're right right I I, and it's in a sense for sure yeah it's yeah but I mean, I wouldn't go that route, but uh, to say <laughs> that about you, but um, you know what I mean? I, I, I get what you're saying, but it also, it comes from, it's, I feel like it's, un, it's more of a jealousy thing. Like, oh, oh I sure. wish I, I could, mean, I wish I could have the confidence to do, you know, what, what, what you're doing or do this or sing this or audition for this. Yeah. I think it was just like, everyone was confused and like, 
quite came from a jealous standpoint. It didn't mm -hmm. really affect me like insanely. I think it just the whole like part of me going over correcting so far comes mm -hmm. from me not fitting into my Christian community mm -hmm. that I grew up in and like like almost wanting that community like I just I never felt understood by that side of my life and I think that's the community where I'm just like you think I'm crazy well like I'll show you how crazy I am you know like yeah. that kind of vibe. um I don't know if that makes sense it's a no very it does strange, it does like, it's a, it's like a 14 year old me version like the version of of myself like running my whole like artist project of being like this I don't know I don't even know how to describe it <laughs> no I I get what you're saying because you, you're able to be yourself and and say what you want to say and th these are probably things that I mean at least what you told me about you know you turn 21 you mm -hmm. go to the Abbey in, in West Hollywood and this is just like everything that you were probably told you shouldn't be around okay. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and then it's well this is the place i feel the most at home because i've been kind of told the, uh, the opposite that's, and then to have that's that what i'm trying to say i'm not describing it well at all but it's like exactly what you're saying <laughs> it's what i'm trying to say no 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 and i'm just going up just because i fresh the interview and how yeah. you phrased it last time and 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 just being exposed to gay culture and being exposed to all this stuff that's happening and like drinking's probably bad and this is bad and this is wrong and then you're like no this is like I feel like I'm finally in a place that I'm comfortable like you had comfort in this when you're being told you shouldn't have any you shouldn't just like this is don't be around these people don't be around this and then yeah. for you to feel the complete opposite I'm sure throws back some resentment towards all those people that told you that growing up and yeah, you didn't know any didn't know any better right right so yeah I, that's that would be huge i'd be so like that's a lot to to, to kind of un, unpack yeah my i wish i could just be like oh my artist project is just me expressing myself like it's just like and it is but at the same time it's like it's kind of like a fuck you project like Right. Like, it's a big like every person <laughs> this is what I was told a lot whenever I was like 17, 18, just getting mm -hmm. signed, moving to LA. People would always just like beg me <laughs> to not turn into Miley Cyrus. And in my head, like I was like loved Miley Cyrus right like, you're like you I mean that she, badass I was like, <laughs> like, why would I not like, want to be her, <laughs> her with, on the VMAs with the foam finger like rocked my, my world whenever like my whole community growing like that was all the talk like the whole rock the world uh, but especially yeah. like for like my like very conservative very you know modest community that was like a huge no-no like that is not okay, especially Miley coming from like Hannah Montana to that, you know, her right. authentic self. Um, the people are very concerned with me becoming that. And so that is who I wanted to become, obviously. Like I was, and that, and that I think is what I mean by when I like, I want to make my hometown hate me whatever that means it's like becoming miley the my version of miley and it's right. like because i was told like that was the a bad thing to become and it's like not and like granted i'll never be become that like miley no one can be miley but like my version of that is pink pony club like my version right. of that is feminine like mm -hmm. me and like ashless chaps riding a dirt bike around my hometown like that is my version of being like, see, I am that. You told me not to be that, and I am. And you know yeah. what? Nothing happened. <laughs> right. Know? I'm the same person, right? Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, don't move. You're going to move to LA and they're going to brainwash you and change you. And you're going to, yeah. yeah, don't let them, you know, do that to you. But mm -hmm. like, yeah, Miley, and was that the same time? Was that the VMAs also or the Grammys when she came out and lit a blunt up? 
like it was not, it was probably I don't even know. I <laughs> it was just like it was she just part. like gave yeah did not give a fuck it was just like the coolest thing ever I'm like that is rad because all of her fans growing up were these little kids that yeah. and she was just like well I'm th this is a part that I'm playing as an actor on this show mm -hmm. It's not, I don't go, this isn't me. I don't go to school and then come home and be Miley Cyrus. Right. I mean, uh, Hannah Montana. Right, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I just think, I didn't, okay, so that's in the video. The video isn't out though, right? The song's so, not even out. Feminine yeah. So there's no video, uh, but the song comes out Friday. Yeah, I heard the song because you, you, your, your team sent it to me. And like, that's why I said I love it. And I love how it okay. starts off with like, this like orchestral kind of ballad -y thing. And then. There's what well, I forgot what you say though. You're like, fuck this or I forgot what you say. on the first, like the first verse. It's or, like when the beat when it stops oh. and then you just yell something and then it goes oh. when it like takes over. <laughs> when I'm like, can you play the fucking beat? And then oh, that's what it is. Yeah. Hit it like rum pom pom pom. Get it. Yeah. John. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That's a perfect example of like the ballady versus the. Mm -hmm. pop whatever pop. <laughs> but so you the dirt bike photos that was all shot in missouri in your hometown yeah. we flew home yeah um on my parents my parents have like a farm so i asked my dad if i could bedazzle his dirt bike and so he let me and i like with the help of friends like built this dirt bike outfit and like modified it to be a almost like a burlesque drag uh-huh version of a dirt bike outfit and we just like shot some photos on the farm and with the dirt bike and some videos of me riding it around and like I just knew it was supposed to be dirt bike themed I don't know I love it yeah it's cool I didn't know if that was like uh, those were just teasers to a, a, a eventual music video that you I used the dirt bike. I okay <laughs> um was that something like when you were putting out, and I didn't ask you this last time, and I don't know if you even feel comfortable answering it, because I know your mom and dad were very, you know, supportive of what you were doing, and like she was getting you the gigs and, you know, yeah. you know, signing you up for all these things and playing the country clubs and this and that and the other thing. Like when you get to LA and you put a song at like Pink Pony Club, and is that something that, since they're still there, were you, were they you know, does it come back to them, like the conservative community being like, can you believe what your daughter's doing or? They get that from the outside, but like to them, but they are not, they, they don't put their concerns over my happiness. Right. Okay. So, I love that. But, but, but they do get the, they probably get the, the get wrath. That. Okay. Yeah. I mean. But they don't care. I love that. No, they, I mean. I mean, you have to be pretty ballsy, like, look, Midwestern, like, where I, my hometown, like, no one's going to go up and, like, give you a piece of their mind, like, <laughs> like, the people are too polite, like, okay. they're, you know, if, if any, it's, it's more so, like, talking behind people's backs, so, like, no one's going to go up to my parents and go, well, your daughter looks like a whore, or, like, you know what I mean, like, yeah, and my parents are, like, they are very supportive in my art, even though it is like hypersexual and um, it's like purposefully tacky, trashy, like opposite of how I've, you know, the community that was like encourages women to be. Um, and they are still supportive. They have to, they just are really good at like knowing that Chapel Round is a character mm -hmm. and like Haley is their it's daughter. You you know <laughs> yeah so they're really good at like separating the two that this is like a performance piece and it's not that's cool yeah I like, it that. Is. like even like to myself like chapel run is like a performance project so it's like yeah it's no, easy it, for me to separate for sure for sure so from like uh, you, you talked about atlantic you know getting dropped and and all of that like was that did that kind of play into at all and and if i'm stepping over Stepping your, I don't know. I don't want to like offend you. I was just curious, yeah, like, because earlier you were talking about like, you know, just kind of like, you know, I don't know if I, if music is going to be my, my end game type deal. Yeah. Like once that happened, did that kind of like deflate the balloon a little bit? Like, were you, 
prior to that, were you kind of wrapped in it and excited all the time about, oh, you know, all this stuff's happening. I get to do co-writes and write these videos and blah, blah, blah. And then does that fall into that or was that you're already kind of feeling that before? I was deflated as fuck um, while I was signed. Okay. Getting dropped is what made lit the fire. Like, like, you think, I mean, I thought that when I got signed, like, they make it seem like your dreams are all going to come true. Like they will tell you everything. Like I was told that I I was going to, they were going to put like a Grammy campaign behind like some of my music when I was 17. Like they just like say shit, like Mm -hmm. just get you excited. And um, so I was bummed even before I was dropped. I like, to be honest, like getting dropped was the best thing that could have happened to me. And I wanted it to happen for a long time, even though I didn't want to admit it. I, I wasn't happy and I was very trapped and I didn't feel heard. And I think the people on my team could do the best, that, they did the best that they could. But unfortunately, like in the label system, it's not your team that makes the decisions. It's the high, like the, the people who have the money at the top. So, right. um, and unless, and like all they can look at is numbers. And so when, you know, my team would turn in like the reports and they would see, oh, Chapel's not that this project isn't like making the money that we need her to make. And so they just, in return, wouldn't give me the budgets I needed to push my career forward. So it was sad all around. Like Mm -hmm. I was sad before I got dropped. I was sad after I got dropped because I was like, fuck, am I going to make it out of this? And it was sad. I did feel like a failure but out of that failure like rebirthed a version of myself that like I felt like I could finally be Mm -hmm. which is like this this year's music like Naked in Manhattan and I think is Karma Feminine Nominon like we have an album coming out like that birthed like joy Mm -hmm. you know yeah, I mean, because, yeah, they, they could tell you everything you want to hear in the beginning, right? Oh, well, we have all these artists and we've got, a, you know, basically we're going to, you, know, you said they're going to put a Grammy campaign behind you. But then when it comes down to it, it's like they're going to throw all their money at Lizzo or whoever else is under the label that they want. That's our, you know, well, yeah. they, and there's so many bands that kind of fell off or artists that kind of get pushed on the wayside or they get like yeah. shelved or there's just not enough attention there. Oh, yeah. I mean, I had an album shelved. Like I had, I was supposed to like have an entire album come out and I got shot. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah, I mean, when you're, major labels just like aren't, the system isn't set up to to grow baby artists. Like it is made to grow artists that are doing well and to make them do better. Mm -hmm. So like a development deal doesn't, isn't real. Um, yeah, especially anymore. I mean, because now numbers are so cut and dry. It's like, well, you don't have 10 million streams. And you're like, well, right. I do on Pink Pony Club. Right. But, uh, <laughs> no, but you know what I mean? You know what I mean? It, yeah, no, I, I'm just kidding. But you, Some people it works, but it did not work for me. And it doesn't rare, work. though. If you look at a look at their roster and you could throw a dart at maybe one or two people that you that are recognizable names. It's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. And I'm just lucky that I'm mm-hmm. in a better place now than yeah. it was. Yeah, I want to move on to a positive here yeah. because if you have an album shelves, you spend all this time, like you were signed to the label when I talked to you, uh, Pink mm-hmm. Pony Club was put out through them, right? And uh, then you had this this record and you can't, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're kind of in, in a contract, a binding contract where it's not like you could just be like, I'm going to put this song out now. I'm going to put out Naked in Manhattan now. Like I want it to go out. Like, they won't let you do that right and then they probably owned all those masters of the record that got shelved so then you're starting at square one yes so i like that whole shelved album will not see the light of day which is fine it's for the best because it wasn't meant to i'm, I'm glad okay that it got shelved but like i got very lucky and got to keep my masters of all of my unreleased songs that i still wrote on the label um 
Oh, wow. Okay. So I, it, like, I, I got to keep like majority of the master of like, um, Pink Pony Club in California and Love Me Anyway, which I released while I was on the label. Mm-hmm. But, um, which is great. And people who don't understand that, that means that you actually own the song. So if it gets streams and, and you make money, like you are the one making money, you're not just them giving, taking the money. Because you they, do, they still do take like a portion, but But yeah, not to the point like, of everything. Yes, they don't take everything. Thank okay. goodness. Um, but yeah, I like I wrote Naked in Manhattan shortly after Pink Pony Club and I own like a hundred percent of that master. Amazing. So they, they were very kind in letting me like take your stuff and but mm-hmm. so yeah. But the whole album, none of that will ever come out. Like they're just songs that you had written that it all came together and then it didn't work out. And then yeah. you 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 leave that deal. And at that point, what are you thinking? Are you like, I'm still going to put out music. I don't care. Yeah, I kind of knew that like the the shelf, the album that got shelved that will never see the light of the day of day will um, that was before Pink Pony Club came out. So like, oh, okay. That album was supposed to come out in 2018. And um, so even before I, I talked to you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, so wow. That album was um, but then they shelved that album and then they, they told me to like, you need to like start over. And so when I started over, that's when I switched lanes into the Pink Pony Club, like pop era. Got so, it. Um, now this like new album I wrote, like 99% not on the label. So like Naked Manhattan's like the only one that is from the label, but um, it's all like pop, like new, the new pop era. Okay. Yeah. So mo- like moving on, like you, you left, you have this, you've kind of found yourself this new, the sound that you wanted in this process. And do you start working on, when do you start working on this, this record or is it done? And like, tell me kind of like how, from the last time I talked to you, what, you, you know, California came out and then it was like, how soon after that does the label thing happen? And then you move on to writing what's now all this new music coming out. Right. Yeah. So dropped in August of 2020. I <laughs> moved back to LA after that, get a job at a donut shop work at the donut shop for a long time and continuously writing with like doing sessions at the same time. Um, last summer, I got signed to Sony Publishing, which is not a label. It's mm-hmm. different, but luckily I got a little bit of money so I didn't have to do a part-time job. Mm-hmm. And so then I was like full-time writing and like making this like world of like a record situation. And then um, we've just been working on that for the past, like Dan Niger and I, who made like Pink Pony Club and Naked Manhattan. And he produced Naked Manhattan and like we wrote Kink and like Kink is Karma together and Feminine Nominon together. Um, so we're like 60 to 70% done with the album I would say it's like we just the songs are there we just have to like produce them you know wow Mm -hmm. so it's we've got like a full project but it just tightening it up kind of yeah wow that's exciting though this is something that you're you must be really proud of it I mean and to be able to put it out on your own I mean through Sony publishing, but like, it's essentially an independent record. Oh, it's, in, it's independent. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I pay for it and all the money comes out of, you know, my pocket and Dan is like lovely and like my friends who helped me on the record, um, thankfully like reduced their rates and like helped me as like a friend, mm-hmm. just very, very kind. Um, but yeah, we have, I mean, I'm super proud. Like it is really hard to make a body of work and I've never released anything bigger than an EP before. Mm-hmm. So um, that's, it's probably not going to come to like next year though, like mm-hmm. March or something. Okay. You know? so. And are you going to slowly roll it out with more music? Yeah. So that's what, that's what like this whole year has been. So if we've had like Naked in Manhattan coming out and came out mm-hmm. in February, mm-hmm. And I think we had my kink is kind of come out April. I'm pretty sure April or May. Mm-hmm. And now we have 
Feminine Phenomenon, and we'll have another one come out um, right before the Fletcher Tour in October. Which is so, going to be huge. Fletcher Tour is going to be awesome. I'm really excited about that. Yeah, that's but, cool. That'll be uh, yeah, that'll be a huge tour. Yeah. So the whole thing is like me releasing like little singles and just like building up to an album. Mm -hmm. so, so. And the album is to, to have it be, you know, your first real studio, like debut album is cool. And then it's, is it kind of following this cohesive like storyline or like are all the songs kind of in the same vein? Yeah, they're all very much in the same like pop, like glittery just like fun anthemic narrative pop mm -hmm. awesome very cool well tell me about uh feminine feminon i can't i would keep screwing it's really it hard. i always it's like two words put together feminine it's phenomenon and feminine yeah. feminine i'm dyslexic so it makes it even more i know difficult. a lot of people are like this is really hard for dyslexic people too uh, so i split it up in two okay like, Feminine is the first word. Uh -huh. And then the second word is nominon. Nominon. Feminine nominon. Feminine is the first word. Feminine non. <laughs> Sorry. Nominon. It's okay. Second word is nominon. Nominon. Femin yeah. Feminine. Feminine. Nominon. Nominon. Yes, feminine nominon. Yes. Feminine nominon. <laughs> This is so difficult for me. I, I swear to you, I spent 10 minutes like saying it out loud, trying to get, and then I would listen to the song because you say it in the song. And I'm like, okay, so maybe if I, and I still, I just can't do it. Yeah, it's like hard. I said, it's a it's hard. It's not a real thing. word. It's just not a word. So it's, a, it's really difficult. It's coming in on the one. <laughs> but the fact that you can sing it out, that's amazing. It's, yeah, I always like, people are like, this is fucking hard to say. And I'm like, I always say, I know you know how to say supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Like I know everyone can say that, so I know that they can they can get feminine nominon. It'll it's feminine hard. Nominon. Feminine, feminine nominon. Okay, I, I I'll get it. Feminine nominon. This yeah, there you go. It. There. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I knew I knew what it was. I knew how it would sound like, but my mouth just will not. It's just this brain to mouth <laughs> thing that's not working out. <laughs> Okay, well, tell me about the song because we were chatting about it quite a bit. I mean, obviously, it starts off with this very cool like ballad, and then it, you know, <laughs> drop the drop the fucking beat or yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> to be honest, like we wrote the song at the end of a day where we had like given up, and like we were working on this one, this one idea, and it just like wasn't working, and we were just so frustrated. It was Dan and I, and we just started like messing around with like a fun little like section of the song the the chorus is like what we started out with it was it's just like so strange how how it all came together because it's like not a traditional structure at all mm -hmm. um but like it literally just started out as like we had given up that day and like made this like little thing and then we started going off of that and like Dan like came up with the word feminine nominon like and I'm to be honest like every time I write a song after I leave I'm like that is the dumbest thing ever that is like such a bad idea like I hated my kink is karma after I walked out of that session I was like this is really, this is a really bad idea but now I love it so right. I, I mean I love feminine nominon like so much um and I, I wanted to write about, um, I went on a lot of different hinge dates last year, like 12, like, okay. I, like I was trying, like, I really, I'm like such a romantic and just like want to be in love so badly. And so my therapist was like, you have to date a lot of people then you have to find someone, you know, mm -hmm. just, even if you don't know if they don't seem like your type, just give them a chance. And so I would, and of course it would be horrible. Um, and we just weren't compatible, like no one was working. And um, so that's where like the, I'm so sick of online love line comes from. And then uh, I was dating men and I, and it was like just a disaster. And when I, um, I dated one woman, and 
by far like miles beyond like we didn't work out but it was just like so much more enjoyable and and just like just got along so much better and so that's kind of like what it was like to um what the song's kind of about is like it's a feminine phenomenon like <laughs> to to make it like blunt like very blunt it was like boys can't like are like very um bad in bed <laughs> and girls aren't so that was kind of like the song <laughs> okay <laughs> Like, that's what I mean when I say, like, it's a feminine phenomenon. Like, like, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. It's, that's the basis of the song, though. Okay. Girls are better in bed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Um, well, I, again, I think the song is incredible. I love how it is, like, just for me, it was totally unexpected. And I'm like, okay, this is rat. Like I like, even I like the, the, how it started off as a ballad. I'm like, okay, maybe she's going back to this ballads. And then it, <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> a ballad. Um, and I, I mean, everything you've put out thus far over the past year has been so good. Even, you know, from pink pony club on, I, I'm just a fan and I can't wait to hear the record. And I think it's so cool that you're able to do all this, you know, uh, independently. Thank you. I think that's why I'm, I'm most proud of it is because it's independent. And like, I have some awesome friends who like bust their ass for me for free. Yeah. Or like super low rate. Like that's the way that this is happening is because my friends are working for free, like, or shooting a fourth of what, like, like my photographer who shoots all my covers, like is doing me such a solid, like it, it's just so this isn't just me at all. Like this is everyone just like giving so much of their time to make this project look like it's a major label project. Mm -hmm. Like, I like, honestly didn't know, like it, it seriously took me like really reading into how these songs were coming out that it wasn't on Atlantic anymore. It, just cause I, mean, it, I was like, oh, it, like what's, it doesn't seem like it was any different. I'm operating even like, more as an independent artist like putting out more content more right. like promo more just we're doing so much more as an independent artist and like well you don't have all the red tape and the, the gatekeepers and the a and r people and the this and the like all the sign offs and it is like a major label c artists like like me who do a lot of the work for them and that is exactly who they want to sign because obviously mm -hmm. like, labels want to do like the least amount that they can and get the biggest bang for their buck sure and so like i have labels you know i take label meetings more and more um and signing to a label isn't like out of the question for me because to be honest i know there's you can only go so far as an independent artist mm -hmm. seriously like you can't there's no one on the radio that is an independent like right now in top 10 like right yeah i mean i came from radio i saw the thing work I mean, like you, you know, know yeah you it's, know how it works like you it's need all a sh it's all handshakes and you know and, yeah, it's and funny. Behind like, you yeah. millions of dollars to even get a song on the radio like mm -hmm. i can't do that for myself and i don't even know if i want that but in in case like like i don't have fifty thousand dollars to go do a headline tour with Mm -hmm. like I need a label for that type of stuff but it's like unless I'm getting a deal that benefits me just as much as it benefits them I'm not gonna sign like I, I have no desire the whole like big signing check that you get is not attractive to me anymore like it's probably not even there anymore as much right no not, no not really and I mean, the label isn't coming out to your house and like, here's a, here's a hundred million dollars to front and everything and just go here. We're going to buy this mansion, just go wild and write the best album ever. Like those, yeah. those days are dead. They're not selling records anymore. No. So I, it would have to take a very special, awesome deal for me to sign where I have a lot of control and a lot of money to play around with. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not like, 
my viewpoint on like the whole like money system within music has changed so much where I'm just like I don't even know if I'm trying to like go to radio anymore because that just seems so just that I have friends who like I see what they're going through I'm like this seems kind of horrible like I don't know why everyone is like trying to go do this like for the artist (laughs) it seems kind of like hell I mean everyone else is like making money but I'm like this seems kind of horrible um but that's so funny so and i'm only gonna i'm not gonna mention the artist because i had to remove a lot of the the, the interview because they mm-hmm. have had or I, I think they still have a massive song on the radio and i was like yeah. asking them like what was it like and they're like i never i've never even listened to the radio in my life like they're like you know in the gen z crowd that's and funny I just, At least being honest, was, like, that's and so, it was so good and i was dying laughing because i'm like well yeah because if this TikToker shares your sound and their reach is 90 million, you know, you're like LA County is like 12. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. it's just like the scope is so different. And, yeah. and I mean, and I came from radio, I was in radio for 17 right. years and I just, wa- and I was, I started when it was like literally peak and like in decline. And now it's yeah. like in shambles. Like I'm surprised yeah. people are shooting for the radio anymore. It makes it still makes it still makes money. It still makes the most money out of everything. Because so, you get paid per play more exactly. with ASCAP and BMI. I'm sure that's why. Yeah. I mean, you can put, get probably get a hundred million streams on Spotify, and they give you send you a check for like six bucks. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's not as much as you as it should be. Right. Sure. Of course. But and I know there's stuff happening behind the scenes when it comes right. to that. But it's just like I guess that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, it's to me, it seems like the. Re- the return on investment for an artist to be, I don't understand how radio still pays. It's like, how? <laughs> yeah, I know. How many car dealerships are there that are like still willing to throw money at some commercial break? Um, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, I feel that. Yeah. But I, I think it's cool that you are in the space now where you, you've you been there with the label and you've you've seen how that works and, and yeah. you know you can create and you know that you can get streams and, and sell tickets and still yeah. open up for Fletcher and Olivia Rodrigo without having to answer to anybody. No. And I think that the power comes from, it's because I'm not desperate. I'm not desperate for fame and money right now. Mm-hmm. And, and so that gives me, and that's like truly kind of all that labels can give you. Right. And I don't really need any, either of those things right now. Like, yeah, obviously it'd be fire to have like, money where I don't have to like worry about my rent anymore like that would be awesome I would love to have a savings like but I've never had that so and I'm fine Mm -hmm. so this whole like money thing that they can like wave in your face like it's like I'm not gonna take it right now because I'm not in like I'm not desperate so that's kind of why I have power, but one day that will change, you know? I think that's so cool. I love your outlook and I love your honesty. And the fact pretty, that you're I, like- I have a pretty big chip on my shoulder about the music industry. It's not like super healthy, but I am honest. It's maybe not like the most positive outlook on, on it, and, but I do admire people who- I mean, not- there's few artists that, I mean, have major success that have, been able to do what you're doing as far as turning their back on like <laughs> but you are doing it i mean the fact that you you know still you put songs out and they get, still get millions of streams and attention i think that's something to be said and you're opening up for fletcher and you did the, like i said olivia rodrigo tour like the most independent artists can't do that i mean it's because i mean i mean i, I don't know why I, I mean obviously like i bust my ass but like you bust your ass you're talented i bust i bust my ass and i like happen to be talented and I happen to come like into this the industry at a really young age and learned a lot and gotten fucked over a lot so I know what to avoid mm-hmm. but also like the people who listen to my music are just like so rad like so supportive and just love that I'm independent mm-hmm. love that I support the queer community love that I like give attention to like the like quiet Midwestern kids who are gay. Like, it just, it's like, it's, it's, oops, sorry. 
Um, it's, yes, I bust my ass. I happen to be talented, but like my friends work for free. They bust their ass. And also the people who listen to my music bust their ass and advocate for me. Like everyone's just busting their ass. Like that's why I don't have, I don't have like a label to just like throw me a million dollars. Money makes things so much easier, but like it also makes things so much more complicated. So I'm fine. I'm fine right now. Maybe yeah. in now I'll be like, okay, I want money now. Like, but right when, now, when we, when we talk again in a year, <laughs> but yeah, you, you never, I think, like I said, I admire you so much and what you're doing. I think it's so awesome. And uh, especially coming the independent route, like uh, my, the people, like Alice Merton is a big example of somebody I see as like, she never, you know, stepped in the labor route. It was like, oh, you don't like what I'm doing. I'm just going to do it anyway. And then I'm going to have, you know, one of the biggest songs of X, you know, time frame with no right. roots or whatever. So right. exactly. um, do you have any advice for aspiring artists? <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Learn as much as you can and do it, do as much as you can yourself. So you don't have to rely on so many other people to get the job done for you such as learning Pro Tools or Logic or like learning how to record yourself, learning Photoshop to make your own tour posters, like learn how, learn about social media marketing. So you don't need to rely on a label to, to do that stuff for you. You know, learn how to, all everything you can about your keyboard, like, especially if you're a woman learn how to do this shit yourself so you don't have to rely on men like that's why i see about independent artists just like learn this shit yourself so you have the power so no one can take that away from you i think i think that's my advice it's just like believe in yourself that you can do all this stuff there's a lot of dumb people doing things if they're dumb and doing it you can too that's what i always say in my head i'm like they're an idiot and they know Pro Tools. That means I can learn Pro Tools. Bring me a bad word.